wonderful to see you all here. I'm delighted to welcome Matthew Thomas to Concordia tonight. I always like to start out by thanking the friends whose support makes these programs possible. And I also want to thank my colleague, Amy Holman, you know, if Amy is here, oh, right there, who uh, is assistant to President George here at the college, and she is the one who introduced me to We Are Not Ourselves. Uh, she said, Ellen, there's this great book that, covered, that features my neighborhood in Queens. So I promptly read it, and I said, Amy, it talks about Bronxville. We have to get him here. <laughs> but actually, the novel is about so much more than those two places. And soon after, everywhere I turned, people were talking about this book. Even the New York Times and the New York Post were in agreement. How often does that happen? <laughs> Janet Maslin from the New York Times called the book a devastating debut novel, an honest, intimate family story with the power to rock you to your core. And John Podhoritz of the New York Post proclaimed it the best American novel in a very long time. Now a nationally best-selling author, Matthew Thomas's success is impressive and inspiring. For so many writers who work like he did for years on their craft, his novel is an affirmation that great writing is recognized and gifted writers are valued. And I think that's important for all of us, for readers and writers alike. I have to say the poetry lover in me was caught from the start. Your selections from Stanley Kunitz's Touch Me and King Lear, pitch perfect in setting the tone for your story. And I think you have a touch of the poet yourself. Your words are deliberate and precise, and your characters and images are vivid, real, and honest. I think We Are Not Ourselves conveys the complexity of the human heart. And Matthew Thomas's story is a testament to the heart's amazing capacity for hurt and healing, hunger and hope. Please join me in welcoming Matthew Thomas to Concordia. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, it's a huge pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I might have to just hope you can hear me if I don't lean all the way down. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this, I've been on uh, a tour for this book for about seven weeks. And I've been all across the country. I've been to Canada, several cities in Canada. And the fact that I'm finishing this tour tonight as my last appearance reading this book is a great pleasure for me and a um, kind of spiritual thrill because this town has been so important to me, to me in my life and to my family's life. So thank you for welcoming me. Uh, and I will try to do something to raise this up. If, oh, maybe I can, can I use this one? Or this one, no. Okay, I'm just going to do this. I've, I've done this before. I did this at, I did this at Glucksman Ireland House, as my family can attest to. Um, yeah. Okay. Or you just raise the, the, the volume on the mic. All right. Perfect. Great. Um, so I will read a little bit from a, a few sections in the book, and then I'd like to really turn it over to uh, what I think of often as the, the best part of an evening like this, which is the question and answer and conversation. Um, just wanted to say a little bit about the story um, that you heard just now, which is to say I was teaching at Xavier High School. I taught there for um, parts of eight years. And uh, I wrote at night, often late at night, and on the weekends and in the summers, heavily in the summers. I would start writing sometimes at midnight, write for two hours and fall into bed and get up very early, as you have to for a high school teacher. Uh, so it, I, do, I do hope people take some inspiration from the idea that work can get done under um, extreme circumstances, and also that it's possible to work in the shadows for a long time and come out into the light, as I did. Um, there was no guarantee of anything, and, and I never did have a sense uh, while writing it that at the end of this, there was a, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. There was just a hope, and that hope drove me forward. So hopefully others will be able to take something from that. Uh, I'll just start reading. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write. I'm going to read mostly from Eileen's perspective. Eileen is born in Woodside, Queens, in 1941, and uh, from an early age dreams of a better life than the one she has. After St. Catherine's, she went on scholarship to St. John's for her bachelor's, enrolling in the fall of 1962. Her plan was to take summer classes, finish in three years instead of four, get through grad school, and begin the path to administrator pay. 
She earned spending money and savings for the nursing administration degree tuition to come as a dress model at Bonwood Teller. Women came to look at dresses and she showed them how they could look if they lost a few inches from their waist or were taller or had neat divots by their clavicle or a galvanizing shock of black hair or smooth skin or arrestingly heavy-lidded owlish emerald eyes. What they had on her was money and the insolent ease that came with it. Despite herself, she became the preferred girl in the showroom. She didn't try to push dresses on potential buyers by slinging a hand at the waist and jutting an elbow out. She simply put a dress on and stood there. She didn't smile or not smile, make eye contact or avoid it, speak to customers or remain silent. She did whatever came naturally to her. If her nose itched, she scratched it. She turned to show them the dress at all angles when they asked her to, and when they were done looking at it, she went back to the dressing room and took it off. The other girls seemed to linger more, attempting to convince themselves of what they hadn't convinced the customers of. She daydreamed that the next person who walked in would be a rich man looking for a dress for his girlfriend who would see her and change his mind about the drift his life was taking. He would let her forget about nursing, fly her around the world, care for her parents' needs. She could sleepwalk through life, never changing a dirty bedpan, never batting away an exploratory hand when she leaned over a man in his senescence never pressing through a fog of halitosis to take an old lady's temperature, never working another day, never thinking another thought. She would come back to the store and sit in the chair and put the girl through her paces. She'd make it seem as if she was going to leave without buying anything, that she'd wasted everyone's time, and then she would order one of everything to remind them that they had no idea how women like her really lived. But the only people who showed up were women a little older than her or teenage girls with their mothers. They said how radiant she looked, but she could hear them thinking of themselves. One afternoon in April of 1963, a girl about Eileen's age came in looking for dresses for her bridesmaids. The girl made apparently random selections, projecting a nervous aura. She looked familiar, alarmingly so. Only after Eileen had modeled a handful of dresses did she realize the girl was Virginia Towers, who had left St. Sebastian's in seventh grade to move to Manhasset. Eileen prayed she wouldn't recognize her, but while Virginia was examining the seams, she started patting excitedly on Eileen's shoulder. Eileen! Yes? Eileen! Eileen Tumulty! Virginia's voice was all heedless abandon. Eileen raised her brows in silent acknowledgement, perturbed to be addressed so familiarly in a place where she'd worked to keep her distance from the other girls. It's me, Ginny! Ginny Towers! Virginia, my goodness, she said mutedly. Kind, sincere Virginia had been the only kid in her class with an investment bank e executive for a father. Her father was also a Protestant, though her mother was a Catholic who'd grown up in the neighborhood. No one teased Virginia, even though she'd been shy and fairly awkward. It was as though her family's means draped a protective cloak across her shoulders. What are you doing here, Virginia asked. There was no answer that wasn't awkward, so Eileen gave the dress a demonstrative little tug in the chest and raised her hands in amused resignation. Right, Virginia said, dresses. She had two in her hands and three more draped across the armoire, none promising. Well, hell, do you like any of these? If Eileen had the money to buy bridesmaids dresses this expensive, she would buy different ones entirely, sleeker ones, less vulgar, more versatile. She was convinced she had nicer dresses hanging in her closet than Virginia did. She owned only half a dozen, but each was perfect. She would never buy five dresses for $20 each when she could snag one truly gorgeous one for 100 she went out infrequently enough that she never worried about being seen often in any of them. I think the one I tried on a couple of dresses ago is quite nice, Eileen said. The lavender one? I knew it! I'd like that one too. I'll just have them order that one then. Standing in the billowing dress, Eileen felt like one of those men in sandwich boards advertising lunch specials. Eileen Tumulty, Virginia said, as though it were the answer to a quiz show question. I'm guessing this is just your day job. I'm doing my bachelor's, she said. I went to nursing school. I figured you'd be on your way to being a doctor or something. You were always the smartest one of us. She felt her face redden. I'm finishing at Sarah Lawrence this year, and I'm getting married. But you knew that already. He's a pen man, very square. He makes me giggle he's so square. My father has set him up with interviews at Lehman Brothers. We're going to live in Bronxville. I'm going to walk to school my last month. She knew of the town. It was a wealthy bedroom community in lower Westchester County. That sounds just lovely. And I know you won't guess what I'm doing next year. What's that? I'm going to law school at Columbia. You were always intelligent, Eileen said, stifling her surprise. 
Not like you. You were a whip. You're very kind. You were more adult. You were, you were more of an adult than the rest of us, Virginia said. I often think about that day in sixth grade when you took me to Woolworths and made me buy a notebook for every class. Do you remember? She remembered, but she didn't relish recalling what an excess of energy she'd had then for grand improving projects, as though she'd thought the moral balance of the world could be restored by a regimen of directed efforts. I remember you weren't the most organized girl, but I don't remember going to Woolworths, no. I think you'd had enough of watching me never be able to find anything when I needed it. You made me separate my notes. That was one of the most helpful things anyone's ever done for me. I'm glad, Eileen said, feeling a churning in her gut. You should come to law school with me. We could be study partners. I'd get the better end of that deal. It was as if Virginia was speaking to her from the outside of a circus cage, clutching a bar in one hand as she absently held a lamb chop in the other. Eileen had to get away before she said something she'd regret. Maybe in my next life, she said, and the awkwardness she'd kept at bay came rushing back at once. The dress's low cut left her feeling exposed. A new customer had arrived, and the other girl was busy with someone else, so Eileen asked Virginia if she was sure about the lavender dress and left her with the woman who arranged the accounts. Please look us up, Virginia said on her way out. Give us a couple of months to settle in. Bronxville, don't forget, we'll be in the phone book. Mr. and Mrs. Leland Callow, we'd absolutely love to have you over. There's nothing so valuable in life as old friends. I'm going to read a couple more sections. This is later. Uh, this is in 1991. Sunday after Mass, instead of taking to the couch, Ed packed a picnic lunch for the three of them and drove them to their spot near LaGuardia. She spread the blanket and they ate the strangely Spartan sandwiches he'd prepared. Turkey on bread, no mayo, no mustard, no lettuce or tomato. They weren't even cut in half. It was the first hint of repose they'd had in who knew how long. She wanted to enjoy it as a family, but Connell took out the gloves, bounding around like a buck, and Ed rose to gratify him. The sun was out after a sojourn behind some clouds. Planes glinted in the sunlight and gradually diminished in the distance, leaving a trail of noise. A light breeze took the edge off the heat. The moment struck her as perfect in the way that quotidian moments sometimes did. She tried to freeze it in her mind, the acid sweetness of her apple, the crunch of it against her teeth, the smell of the grass. It was cheating, in a sense, to circumvent the natural sifting process of memory, but she found that those moments when she stopped and thought, I'm awake, as though in the midst of a dream, were ones she remembered with an uncommon clarity. Ed stood sturdily, a bit stodgily, as he waited for throws to arrive, though a surprising spring entered his step when, when he had to move laterally. His button-down shirt and dress slacks weren't conducive to the activity, but he adjusted gamely. Connell's accuracy suffered in his enthusiasm to return the ball almost as quickly as it landed in his glove. They started out close together. Connell seemed to want to spread out and drifted steadily back. Ed arced his throws in broad parabolas, and Connell threw in a line, though in his zeal he, could, he would sometimes overshoot and said, send Ed scurrying to retrieve the ball before it reached the street. A row of parked cars flanked them on either side. The last thing she wanted was for the pastoral quality of the moment to be shattered along with a window. Ed began to call Connell closer. The boy resisted at first, but crept forward when Ed held the ball in his mitt and waved him toward him. They were back to a distance not much farther apart than they'd been when they first started throwing. Ed signaled to him to slow it down. Not so fast, he said. We're just having fun. I'm not throwing that hard, Dad, Connell said. But she could tell he was. He seemed to be reaching back and giving the throws all his strength. Ed was catching them, but he looked almost frightened at their speed. Slow it down, Ed said, his voice skirting anger. Why? Can't catch it? Connell unleashed a throw that came at Ed like a fist. Ed stepped aside and let it sail past. He gave the boy a look and went to retrieve it. That's enough, she said when Ed was out of earshot. Your father asked you to stop throwing so hard. I'm not. I'm not throwing my hardest. Just listen to him. Okay, he said. Relax, Mom. Ed looked more defeated than angry. He was at the mercy of the Darwinian logic of an adolescent and he stood for a minute, seeming to consider his options, then threw the ball to Connell, who snatched it out of the air mid-hop. She could see it before the ball left his hand, the coiled fury in Connell's body. 
There was something majestic about the physical changes that turned a boy into a man, the inexorability of the need to advance, to clear away the previous generation and make room for the current one. There was also something terrifying about the impending clash between the males in her life. Neither would come out unscathed. Maybe he was angry with his father for yelling at him in the car. Maybe he was upset that his father was having a hard time corralling his throes. Maybe it was the fact that his father had always been a step behind some other fathers. Ed wasn't just older, he was also old-fashioned, but he and Connell had always had baseball in common. Maybe it was too much for Connell to withstand aging's incursion into his father's ability to carry out this ritual. Whatever it was, he put everything he had into the throw, so that as it left his hand, she let out a little involuntary gasp. It came so fast at Ed that he seemed to freeze in anticipation of it. He didn't even try to get out of its way. She could see, as time slowed for her observation, that sometimes since she'd married him, there'd been an attrition in his motor functions. His hand was no longer as fast as his mind. Even from that far away, she could see his eyes widen. The ball struck him square in the chest. He staggered and fell backward, first on his rear, then on his back. She shouted and leapt to her feet and started running. Connell did the same. He was on his knees talking to Ed when she got there, and she pushed him aside. Ed was clutching his chest as though he'd had a heart attack. Connell was stammering apologies. He kept trying to get at Ed as she shoved him away. Then Ed was stiff-arming her as he rose to his elbows and looked at both of them. I'm fine, goddammit, he said. Let me stand up. As Ed stood, Eileen raised her hand at Connell and held it there, poised to smack him. She could feel the way the three of them were suspended in the moment as though in the relief of a sculpture. Her hand throbbed with the need to connect. Her son almost quivered in anticipation of the blow. She smacked him once, hard on the face. The boy doesn't know his own strength, Ed said, taking hold of her wringing hand. He picked up the ball from the ground. Get back out there. Let's go back to the blanket, she said quietly. We've got a few more throws left. We don't have to play anymore, Connell said to Ed. He wouldn't look at her. We're not done, Ed said. Ed, she pleaded, uncomfortable with every possibility she could imagine. Have a seat, he said, pounding his glove. Get going, he said to Connell. Connell walked out half-heartedly. Ed threw it to him, and he lobbed it back. Harder, Ed said. Connell threw again with less force than he could have. Harder, Ed yelled. Air it out. I'm going to read one last section, a short one. She liked the Starbucks by the train station. She'd heard some grumbling when it opened. haagen had been the lone exception to the town's embargo on chain stores. But she saw no reason not to patronize it. She liked the Italianate style of the building, the tiled roof, the real wood. The patio and its tables reminded her of one of the piazzas she'd seen on her trip with, to Italy with Ed. Sometimes she took her coffee out there and watched the professionals heading to the train and the pure, purebred dogs pulling their owners forward, though usually she sat indoors. She went on Saturdays to get away from Ed for half an hour. She didn't gravitate there for any caffeinated talk. She went because it was acceptable to sit alone among strangers and because order prevailed. The line moved quickly, pastries were stacked neatly behind glass displays, the pleasant smells of frothed milk and espresso grounds suffused the air, the music never hurt her ears, and the overheard conversations never devolved into table-slapping self-indulgence. She liked that it lacked the ambiance of smaller cafes with their intimate conspiracies. There wasn't that feeling that she was missing out. People were islands even when they sat together. She liked that no matter how often she went in, the staff never seemed to recognize her. She wanted not so much to be, to be alone as to be left alone. They let her stay as long as she wanted. She sat inside, reading the time she had brought from home. When she let her glance drift from its splayed pages to the neighboring table, she saw that the woman seated there had begun to cry. The woman was younger, perhaps in her mid-thirties. She was not unattractive, with her hair pulled back in a neat ponytail and a close-fitting business suit. She was sitting with her hands tucked under her knees, and her whole torso was heaving with sobs. Eileen tried to read, but couldn't stop looking over in embarrassed amazement. The sobs got louder. The people seated at nearby tables shot each other looks. One man raised his eyebrows at Eileen as if to say, can you believe it? It felt as if the calm waters of her reflecting pool had been disturbed by the entrance of a wild animal. She thought about getting up to leave, but sat transfixed. She had all of five more minutes before she had to get home to Ed. She wondered what this woman expected anyone to do. Was Eileen supposed to say, whatever it is, it's going to be fine? 
Was she a total stranger supposed to press her to her chest and say, there you go, that's it, just let it out? Maybe that was the right thing to do, the only thing. But how did she know it was going to be fine? Could she make those assurances? She decided to bury her head in her newspaper again. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw the woman stand up and leave, heading, out, heading toward Pondfield. She had an impulse to go after her, but she didn't want anybody to think she knew her. She waited a minute and then walked out slowly, throwing out half, her half-full cup. Outside in the fresh air, she felt her resolution wavering. She headed toward her car in the, tra in the train parking lot and got as far as the first row of cars before she turned around and started running toward Pondfield. She couldn't remember the last time she'd run like this. She didn't know if the woman would still be visible anywhere, but she had to at least look for her. As she ran, she saw herself reflected in the shop windows and thought she looked ungainly and ridiculous, flinging her tired body after so foolish a person, especially when she had no idea what she was going to say if she managed to track her down. She got to the corner of Park and Pondfield and looked in all directions. She spotted the woman up past the drugstore, walking in the direction of the train station. She knew what she would say. She would stop next to her and ask if she could help in any way. She would say, you're not alone in feeling like this. She hurried toward her, feeling her heart pound. When she got within a few car lengths of the woman who was past Cravens by this point, she slowed down so as not to seem hysterical when she started talking. She was only a couple of feet behind her now. She took a deep breath. As she passed the woman, she picked up her pace and followed the curve of the block back around toward her car. She walked all the way there without turning around. When she got to her car, she had second thoughts and decided to drive around the block and see if she could find her. She could pull into a parking space and get out and walk up to the woman and just stand there in silence if she had to, if she couldn't bring herself to speak. She could just stand near her and that might help a little. She saw the woman not far from where she passed her. She hesitated for a second and then kept driving. In her shame and embarrassment, she found herself driving the back way home instead of her usual route. Whatever it was, the woman was going to have to work it out herself. That was just the way life was sometimes. You had to handle your own grief. There wasn't any sense pretending otherwise. Thank you. So as I said, I, I would love to answer questions or just hold forth on any topics you're interested in hearing me talk about. Yes. I am Irish. Am I Irish? Yes, I am. It's funny. I, I have a. Everyone in my family is Irish. We have. Uh, we we have a. There was somebody went over to Wales and brought a husband back at some point. Uh, so this Welsh name hitched a ride on what was otherwise an undiluted Irish heritage. A dodgy Welshman uh, infiltrated the ranks, but that's what it is. Yeah, it's controversial whether I, there are, there are quite a few Thomases in Ireland, but I think they all think of themselves as as victims of Wales in some way. Uh, Anybody else? I didn't know that at the beginning. No, was was Eileen going to be the focal point of the book? Uh, did I intend to set? It, did I set out to write it from a female perspective? I, I was writing it from a couple of perspectives at the beginning, and Eileen more or less just inserted herself into the central place in the narrative, and demanded to be the main protagonist. And this character, if you meet her in the book, you, it makes sense that she would because she, she, uh, she's got a go-getter spirit. And I think she just kind of demanded that it be her, her point of view. Uh, one thing that I, I took advantage of in writing from her perspective was just uh, something that I remember being interested in and fascinated by as a kid, which was watching my mother and her colleagues and beyond that, people, women in the newspaper, women in the media who were uh, elected officials, becoming uh, heads of corporations, uh, making a, uh, you know, very, a, a public and prominent inroads into changing the civilization, as it were, in big numbers. There were women in positions of power in numbers that the world had never seen, certainly America had never seen. And uh, that story, the story of, of, of women's changing roles in America over the century, I think of as the most interesting story in the century. So I was able to write about that in, you know, indirectly through this character, who I placed sort of at the center of that kind of uh, shift to go from a working class background to a middle class background with an aspiration to get into an upper middle class uh, situation. And uh, I think of that in many ways as part of the story of the century. So I was happy that that accident kind of emerged. Yeah. Um, how many years it starts in 1950 uh, when Eileen is nine. Um, actually, 1951. She's, she's turning 10 at the end of that year. 
uh, and it goes through, the epilogue is set in 2011, but the main action of the book ends in the year 2000 with a, with a jump forward for the last section to 2011. So it's 60 plus years. Sure, yeah, my, my family moved here just like the family in this book. Um, I was a little older than Connell is in this book when we moved here. Uh, and uh, I went to Regis High School just as Connell did. There are quite a few overlaps in terms of uh, autobiographical material that was drawn from. Uh, so it's, it's certainly a, at least a semi-autobiographical book, but the book really began to come alive when uh, it became a work of fiction and got away from the fidelity to the story that you have to really demonstrate when you're writing strictly autobiographically. The characters eventually became characters and not the people in my family. Um, and, and I would say at this point, the overlaps are, are, are fewer than uh, the, you know, the invention. Um, and ultimately, that was just a matter of letting it be what it wanted to be and not trying to jerry-rig an outcome. Sure. Yeah, I, I, when I was an undergrad at the University of Chicago, I studied English, but I, I took a couple of creative writing classes with a man named Richard Stern, who was um, a colleague of Saul Bellows and Philip Roth's. In fact, he, he was the one who fatefully told Roth, who was a grad student at the time, uh, to just write the way he spoke. And uh, Roth went on to dominate the literature of America for decades after that. So uh, Stern was kind of a, uh, an avuncular figure. Um, he was an older man at that point and um, somewhat uh, set in his ways, but he still was a genius teacher and he gave me a, a, a very good entree into thinking like a writer. My work wasn't in any way mature, but I was thinking more and more the way a writer would think. Um, I went after that to university, I'm sorry, to Johns Hopkins University where I got an MA in fiction. I studied under Alice McDermott, my, my mentor, my thesis advisor. Uh, that was an extraordinary experience because she's not only a genius, but one of the nicest people in the world and one of the most generous uh, people with her insights. She didn't hoard them, she shared them immediately. Things that would have been uh, very difficult to learn over a period of time became instantly assimilatable by, you know, her, by osmosis just, just in five seconds of her time. So that was huge. Uh, and then I went out to U University of California, Irvine to get an MFA after that, because I, I was lucky that the Hopkins program was just an MA, it wasn't a terminal degree. It was one of the oldest programs in the country. It was probably the second oldest after the Iowa program and had made its name by being John Barth's uh, seat. It's where John Barth taught for years, decades. Um, but it was always a Master of Arts program. Now it's an MFA program, actually. So I was lucky enough to be able to, be able to go for more, which was basically time and money. I got a fellowship and I had a few years of teaching assistantship money. Uh, I didn't pay to go to either of those uh, programs except for uh, a small amount to Hopkins and um, it was a great experience. And as for the second book, I'm contracted to write one so I better have one in me. Uh, it's due in five years but I plan to be done in three. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I had a version of a story like this that I wanted to write uh, all those years, but I was writing short stories in those programs, uh, really learning how to write. I actually was working on a different novel at one point during those, but all of that work will never see the light of day, uh, thankfully. Unless, I mean, I should actually just uh, not only throw away those papers, but uh, destroy the computer and, uh, you know, actually drop it into a river, but it, that probably won't happen. Um, yeah, so, and what was the other question in terms of... Uh, I started this book in, um, I, I submitted the first thing I wrote in this book as my last submission to workshop at UC Irvine, which was in the spring of 2003. My father had died in March of 2002. So I had about a year after that before, when I was processing a lot of the emotions around my father's death, and I really began to write this in earnest. Even though I had tried to write around it in, you know, in short stories, that material ultimately y yielded very little fruit. Maybe a 25-page story might exist in this book in, the, in two sentences that have been changed since then. Um, so I started that, I submitted that first section to workshop and then went off on my own. And I think the reason it worked that way was because I knew I was not going to be in workshop anymore and I didn't have to present apparently finished work to workshop. There's nothing, I think, uh, less productive than turning in a first draft of a novel to a workshop environment because it's inherently, necessarily, and at best, 
uh, unfinished work. It ought to be unfinished work because you have to let the unconscious mind do its work in a sense. And the conscious mind comes in and does the filtration after the first draft to shape what is there in a sense. So I think I had to get out of the workshop for this novel to really begin. Uh, and I knew that unconsciously anyway. Yes? What inspired me? Uh, uh, let's see. I was, <laughs> what inspired me to write this book? Beyond just the um, whatever drove me to write it in my spirit and as an artist, I also I was inspired to finish it because I have these three and a half year old twins at home and they weren't getting any younger. Um, my apartment wasn't getting any, any bigger. We were living in a one bedroom apartment the last two years I was writing this, the four of us. Uh, and uh, my, my life as a teacher was very fulfilling. I taught at Xavier High School, and I loved those guys. I loved my colleagues. I loved everything about that job, except for the enormous stack of papers that I graded that was about that tall. No matter how much I chipped away, it, it always kind of grew back to that height. Uh, so that, I, I had a, a dream to write um, more often than I was writing. I would write a couple hours a day, every day, tried to write every day, usually at midnight for a couple hours. Um, but uh, the reason I finished it and was inspired to finish it was that I felt that I, this was my chance to do that. This was my chance to seize my life, the one I wanted that was seemingly dangling there before me but might also be receding from me a little bit too as, I was, as, time, as time passed. So I guess I can speak more easily about what inspired me to finish than what inspired me to start. Yes. People who have, how have people uh, who deal with Alzheimer's reacted to the book or me? Uh, they've, uh, people, those people have been extremely warm, uh, extremely uh, generous. Um, I have heard that it's uh, helped people uh, to get through this experience, which is probably the biggest gift you could give a writer of a book like this to say that it made a difference. Um, I didn't set it out to be a kind of case study but I am really gratified to think that somebody is less lonely uh, because of this experience. Uh, I'm sorry, reading the book. Uh, it's a very isolating experience, and I've heard from people that it was nice to feel that the, that the life that they're living is, has been uh, uh, understood and interpreted. Uh, so it's been great. I couldn't have asked for a better reaction from that. And people have, have told me how much it seems to authentically capture their experience. And I mean, obviously, I think that's because of my experience. My father had Alzheimer's. He died of it. Uh, when he was 62, and uh, he started getting it around the age that Ed is in the book. So uh, I, I wrote from life in that way. Yes? You said that you yourself to Yeah. Oh boy, then <laughs> I set myself up for that one. Um, well, writers think differently than like literary critics, for instance. Uh, and uh, the, I think the most important thing a writer has to do is to learn uh, humility, which is to say, to realize uh, that you're going to get kicked in the teeth a lot and uh, accept that the work isn't going to be what you want it to be. Even at the height of your powers as a writer, there's always a falling off from whatever ideal there is in the mind about that story. But more importantly, I think, humility in, in, in regard to... Uh, being able to appreciate just how much work is going on in any work of literature at the level of intention, uh, to rather than uh, assume a lot of accidents, to assume a lot of intentionality. And when you do assume that, and you see the networks of associations in a work, when you see the patterns that are happening, the light motifs that work through something, there's a kind of breathtaking reaction to it because it suggests that this is, you know, human potential, right? The, the possibility is there that this was all intended by this person. And we, we look at works of literature, hopefully with the notion that um, this is a, as perfected a world as the writer could make it, given the limits of ability and time. And uh, whatever we might be able to perceive in that work, if we assume it was intended by the author, the feeling of humility emerges that you know, we, we are all capable of, the, of, of, of great work, you know, human beings. Uh, and it's easy to feel ennobled by that just by reading, in a way, forgetting what one might do oneself. Uh, so um, the ability to be aware of one's limitations from the start. And I think the, also, aside from that, the... Uh, the sensitivity to nuance and um, a sensitivity to other people's subjectivity, a kind of uh, empathy 
uh, that's always, uh, though that I think is when writers are really um, uh, operating at a high level, uh, they are aware of the, the, the need to speak for others and to others, and not just sort of from within a very selfish place. Yeah. Sure. How did my teaching, how did my uh, experience as a student in, encourage and inform my teaching experiences? Uh, well, it gave me a lot of lessons, first of all, lesson plans. That was great. Uh, I was a beneficiary of a lot of terrific instruction, and um, in many ways, when you are paying attention as a student, what you're doing unconsciously is training yourself to teach, uh, if you keep a good memory uh, and, a, and a good set of notes. Um, the thing that I learned, part of what I was sort of speaking about just now was, not, in, and it's in your question actually, not necessarily teaching writing, but teaching thinking, a, a way of feeling, a, a, a sensitivity, uh, an openness. Um, obviously, the, the idea of, of teaching skills at the level of craft, at the level of the sentence, the paragraph, all of that stuff, but teaching a, a way to, to uh, engage the text actively uh, in a way that much of life discourages. I mean, we are, we are you know, we tend to read the way we read at the beach, which is we read the same paragraph 30 times and don't assimilate it, right? Often, that's how we are distracted nowadays, I think. But I was taught to and tried to teach my students to read carefully, attentively, and, and, and absorb what they were reading. And that is a kind of practice of mind that isn't necessarily intuitive. And I think uh, if you get into that kind of habit, what happens is you end up wanting to read more and more difficult texts things that are a little more challenging, it's like working out. Um, so I tried to encourage the, my students to, to do what I was taught to do, which was to open their minds to the possibility of being uh, overwhelmed by something, to feel the beauty of something. Yes? So over the course of 10 years, as you were writing and rewriting, and people changed a lot. Yeah. Oh boy, uh, how did I change over 10 years and was I pleased with the original work? I mean, much of that original work is gone, thankfully. Um, I learned how to be a person over the course of those 10 years. I learned how to feel more for others, how to be less selfish. I learned uh, how, in, in thinking about these characters, how to, how to sort of think about them first and me second. I ended up getting away from the um, ego-driven work that happens when the writing is about oneself and not about the characters. So the voice would change over time. There was less bombast. There was less uh, explicit uh, attempting to impress anybody because it struck me at some point in writing this that we're all gonna die and that that's not that important. And what really matters is to make somebody feel something and to, to certainly uh, it's possible to make someone feel something simply through aesthetics, that if, if I were to care for the sentences and tend to them enough, that a reader, regardless of the emotional landscape of the book, might feel something just because of the, the way this has been cared for, which I believe in. I believe in that aesthetic uh, transcendence. But I, it also occurred to me that I was working with material that I would be damned if I would let uh, my ego get in the way of these characters and this really emotionally charged material. So I learned how to do that over time. Uh, when you're a younger writer, it really is in many ways about oneself. And uh, I think as you mature, it becomes less so. I also became a parent and that helped me to understand many things I wouldn't have understood in the course of writing this thing because uh, they're just thing, aspects of, of experience that were closed off to me. There's a scene where Eileen is bathing her child. This is a tough woman, a serious woman, who is, is emotionally guarded in some ways because of difficult early childhood traumas and uh, is released in bathing her child to just feel a great amount of feeling. Uh, I would never have known how to feel that way had I not bathed my own child. I don't think I could, my imagination could have taken me there. Uh, so I was tutored by experience, certainly, in the course of writing this thing. Sure, yeah. Thank you. I, uh, why, how do I write in a lot of detail? Um, I think it's part of what I was saying before about habits of mind. Um, I, I may see the world in whatever idiosyncratic way I do, but I think more importantly, if you can uh, 
access a, a kind of um, uh, a, a consciousness that is um, rigorous, which is to say, stay in the moment and not blink and not turn away from it and listen to it as long as is necessary to hear the, the sort of to see, I guess, the, the prismatic way it unfolds, all the details around that moment, it just is a matter of concentration. And I think it's accessible to many more people than think it is accessible to them. I think the, 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 the kind of meditative space that you get into when the writing is going really well allows for that sort of uh, heightened consciousness to emerge where you see more like the way a fly sees. You see all, all facets of something at once. I don't think that that is about talent necessarily. I think it's about a kind of cast of mind and a habit of mind. Um, so, I, I mean, I would say that that's probably less about the way I see and more just the way the mind works when you're accessing its potential. Um, yeah? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I have, I, Hollywood has called. I sold the, the option of this to Scott Rudin, the producer who made uh, No Country for Old Men and There Will Be Blood and Revolutionary Road. Uh, and uh, a lot of other, mo most of the books that, literary novels that get made into films are made by Scott Rudin. So he's the guy to sell it to. Um, whether it ever sees the light of day or not is an entirely different question. Most things don't get made, but he at least has the option of making it if he wants to. Um, so yeah, that's exciting. And they have an actress in mind who's interested in the work. Uh, I can't say who it is, but you've all heard of her. Well, that's, that's, that's exciting. Um, if it actually gets made, she, she can get a picture made. You had another question or? Oh, the follow-up, yeah, Who, who's gonna play Eileen? This, this would be, boy, this would be a great actress for that. So anyway, it's not out of my hands. And, and I'm not writing the screenplay or anything like that. I want nothing to do with it because I took my shot at this story and uh, I'd like someone else, if it ever gets made, to just take it away. Um, anybody else? Yes. It was difficult, yeah. Uh, that was, I wrote that as one of the last things I wrote in the book. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, the very last, interestingly, the, one of the very last things I wrote was one of the hardest things for me to write was Eileen and Sergey saying goodbye. Um, I became attached to that character because he was such an outlet for her and he gave her, he was a kind of valve for her psyche in a way that she needed and would never have known she needed. Uh, this is the, her husband's caretaker who she forms an affectionate relationship with. But that was, I, I, went, I kind of wrote that scene. I knew that I want to wait for that scene and write that scene last. But the letter was probably the second to last thing that I wrote. Um, I had written a version of it and I went back and rewrote it. I wrote it many times, but, uh, but in the form it exists now, it was one of the last things I wrote in the book. And it was difficult to write. In fact, as with other sections like that, some of the more emotionally charged stuff, I write, I write by hand. I wrote the first draft by hand, so uh, I would be I would be rushing to to write as fast as the as the mind was working because when you write by hand, you're slowed down, you're arrested by that. I think a little bit. Um, it, it was useful to me to write by hand because it just generated forward momentum, um, and I, I you, it's very difficult to stop and perfect every individual sentence when you write by hand. Uh, but anyway, I was writing that scene, and I and I felt uh, and writing that letter felt all of the, all these feelings sort of welling up as I was writing it. I just tried to slow it down long enough to capture it and um, stay with it and not miss any of it. And it was really sort of telling me what the next thing was at every moment in the writing of that letter. That was one of those instances where it wasn't necessarily me doing it, you know. And I, I don't mean that to sound mystical. It's just a humility before the suggestions that, that life gives you, the mind gives you. Uh, I was making choices, certainly, but... A lot of the time when it's really working, you, you just accept that it's, it's, it's something a little bigger than yourself when you're doing it. Yes? You potentialize the potential for upward socioeconomic ability, which at times seems almost uniquely American, and reflects it happening all along, it's accelerated by the U.S. bill. Sure. Oh, that's, that's a great question. To what extent, in the middle of a generalized uh, arc toward upward mobility, is there a specifically Irish trajectory to the story? Uh, 
Something that has always struck me as interesting is that the Irish came over here without uh, uh, marketable skills the way the Italians came over here with, for instance. The Italians were stonemasons. They were fine laborers, fine craftsmen. The Irish, for different reasons in history, had their brains and their brawn. They had their ability to uh, uh, interact with other people successfully, and so they became politicians or they became policemen oftentimes. And uh, the, the sense of the man in, in concert with other men, the, 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 the sort of uh, social animal, was definitely a part of the Irish story, I think, for the 20th, first half of the 20th century, certainly. The, the, the way the Irish aggregated together, the way they uh, took care of each other when nobody else would, when the Irish were not welcome in general in society, the sense of a kind of communal existence, the enclaves that they lived in, which is not to say other, group, other groups didn't inhabit enclaves the same way, but uh, just the, the, the notion of a kind of lived life in the public eye with the best thing that could happen in a life being elected office, basically, which is why I think the Kennedy uh, election was such an apotheosis for the Irish. Uh, it was a kind of end of the, of the trajectory, in a sense, for many, this notion that they had made it, they had been assimilated fully into white America, and that they were uh, in some ways on equal footing with the, 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 you know, the kind of Protestant establishment. Uh, but more importantly, that, that the tools that they brought to society were actually useful, were, had, been, had been recognized, which is to say public life and uh, a life of service. So I, you know, I think the Irish story is definitely one of uh, uh, the individual within society, existing in a society and never really living alone. Yeah. Sure, of course. Uh, yeah, the hundredth anniversary of Dylan Thomas's birth is is this year. So yes, everything Dylan Thomas should be celebrating right now. Last question, or uh, not last, but next one. If there's time for it, as many more as want, as we want, go ahead. No, I haven't. I haven't actually. I, I met my seventh grade English teacher last night at a reading in Sunnyside. Uh, and she, was, she gave me the best compliment I've ever heard in my life. She said, uh, I used to save your paper for last, which was really nice. Yeah, it was the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me, probably. Um, so that was lovely that she came out. I haven't heard criticism yet. No, I, I um, well, you know, you go to grammar school with 30 kids and they atomize and they scatter and it's it, only recently did the, this Facebook phenomenon exist and I'm not actually on it, so I just got on it. I lost touch with a lot of those people, but um, I've heard some, some really lovely things. I haven't heard criticism yet. I hope I got Jackson Heights right. I mean, I tried to write that from experience. Uh, it was an interesting place to grow up. It was, it's the most ethnically diverse area in the world now, uh, and that presents really fascinating uh, material to a working writer, I think. How do these people, the old guard and the new guard, how do they interact? Um, uh, incredibly useful for uh, generating conflict, which is the soul of fiction. Conflict is always the thing that fiction needs to survive. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And her life sort of disintegrated in some ways through this marriage, which meant obviously she loved very much. So I'm wondering about if that was something that you were thinking about in the book, and then also about the title. Oh, sure, of course. Revolutionary Road is is a huge influence on my thinking. It's a masterwork. That's a book that at the sentence level never fails. There's not a sentence in that book. You can open that book at random to any page and what he's done is just chiseled it out of stone. And there isn't an errant chip in that sculpture. Uh, so certainly, I, you know, at, in a way that Nabokov, for instance, does the same thing, just encourages you to think of every sentence as a unit. Uh, he does master work at that level. 
Frank in that story is, um, is a lot different from Ed. Frank is uh, an idealist in sort of the worst way. Um, he lives in a fantasy world in many ways, and he takes his wife down with him in a, in, 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 in a kind of pursuit of a very egoistic vision. Ed is quite the opposite, you know, grounded in a far different way, frustrating potentially, but um, Eileen is the one, I think, in that book who I think is the overlap, if anything. She's the one with a vision and uh, I think it's a less scarifying, I mean, that book is a deeply scarifying work. It's, uh, it's one of the great books in American history and it's also one of the darkest. Maybe only uh, less, the only book more dark than it is The Easter Parade, also by Yeats. Um, but uh, the vision that that book provides is not necessary. It's a, it's a relatively misanthropic one at the end. I, I hope I didn't write a book like that. Um, but I, I bow before the majesty of that book. So if any comparisons to it are, are a great compliment. Um, was there another question? Oh, the title, I'm sorry. Yeah, the title. Uh, it comes from Lear. Uh, Lear is saying it to the fool to explain why, uh, uh, I think it's Cornwall, hasn't appeared when he demanded him to come. And Lear is losing his grip on power. This, in the title, there's this idea that uh, when one is sick, the mind is not really working because the body's out of sorts. And I like that because it suggested that there was... Uh, a, a way into uh, thinking about the mind and the body as it kind of interrelated. And, the, and in this case, mind is sort of the spirit and the personality. I think of the body as being the brain and the body, and the spirit, the mind, being everything that is affected by that for Ed. But more importantly, I think of uh, these characters being uh, un unable to be themselves, uh, knocked off the horse by experience. I also think of, of them as... Um, Never, never fully yet themselves, always coming into being, and I kind of find the hope in that, the idea we are not ourselves just yet. We, we have not fully formed. Uh, we have the potential to evolve. Eileen certainly, I hope, demonstrates that by the end of the book. Connell, I think we see him always working toward being a, a, a better person, trying, him, trying to grow. Um, and then the last thing in it is uh, this notion that we are not only ourselves. We are not islands unto ourselves. We, we exist in community and we need each other for the full flowering of our humanity. We don't, uh, we don't really exist without relationships. So we are not ourselves alone. We are not only ourselves, I think is, hope, I hoped was part of that title. Yeah, one more question. Yes. Thank you very much for saying that. What a lovely way to end this. I appreciate that. Thank you all for coming out. Matthew talked about the importance of community partnerships and just some of the um, shops in town mentioned in his novel are uh, Topps Bakery and their savories are outside and Pernice and uh, tri uh, Triforos and Pernice's flowers are here. So I'm gonna have him pick one ticket and the winner of that one will get the flowers and another ticket will get a book and all of you can buy a book from Romrath's, another shop in town and Matthew will sign them outside. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mix these up just a little bit uh, so that it's completely random. Hold on. Okay, how about this one here? Nancy, Libby. Oh. Hey, all right. One more. One more. Okay. One more for the book. One more for the book. All right. Nancy Lerner. Wow. All right. It's a good day for Nancy. <laughs> <laughs>